Welcome back to Answer in the Air. I'm Aaron Gallagher. I've got with me Don Blackwell. And in this program, this is actually part two um, of a video we're reviewing. Uh, on Answer in the Air, people submit videos to us and ask us to, to watch the video and let them know if what's being taught is biblical. And so uh, in this video, we're looking at a video called Do You Need to Be Baptized to Be Saved? Uh, by Alan Parr, who runs a YouTube channel called The Beat. And so this is actually part two of the video. In the end of part one, we got into a clip, it was about a minute long, uh, referencing John chapter three and some other passages. And we tried to kind of cover it really quickly, but you know, we thought, hey, look, we're doing multiple episodes now. Let's go back and just sort of watch the clip and spend a little bit more time on it now. So we're gonna go ahead and play this clip and, uh, and then we'll stop it and analyze it. Okay. It says here in John three thirty six, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So I want you to notice how many times Jesus simply says, if you want to have faith, simply believe, and that's it. John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and what? Believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Now that's just a couple of verses in John. You could also look at John John 3, 15 and 16, John 3, 18, John 6 and 40, also John 6 and 47. But here are several more verses as well. In the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 31, the jailer called for light, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He says, hey, what do I need to do so that I can experience salvation? Notice their response. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay, Don, so in this section um, we just touched on in the last episode, he quotes really a lot of verses uh, that say a person must believe. We agree a person must believe, right? Sure. Yeah. But then he makes a statement in his explanation uh, where he says, you know, these verses say that Jesus said a person must believe and that's it. Right. So when you look at all those verses from John 3, John 5, John 6, etc. Does Jesus ever say you must believe and that's it? He does not say that. And that's what was interesting. He said, I want you to notice how many times Jesus is going to say, just believe and that's it. Simply mm -hmm. just believe and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I listened to all the verses he quoted. Jesus never said simply believe and that's it. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that you need to believe and we understand that. He never said faith only or that's it. One of the things I think people need to understand is the context of mm -hmm. John chapter 3. Mm -hmm. If you pull any verse out of context, and we, we talked about this in the last episode, if you pull a verse out of its context, you can make it teach anything. The context of John chapter 3 is that a man named Nicodemus had come to Jesus wanting to know what he needed to do. Jesus said that a man needs to be born again. And then specifically, he said he must be born of water and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Being born of water is a reference to water baptism. Mm -hmm. And then if you keep reading, 60 seconds later mm -hmm. in verse 16, he, so in John 3, 5, he says you must be born of water. That is water baptism. In verse 16, which is 60 seconds later, he, he tells Nicodemus that a man must believe mm -hmm. in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus is not negating what he said 60 seconds mm -hmm, earlier. Mm -hmm. He is saying, he's not saying, well, I said you have to be born of water, but just ignore that. Now, now you just have to believe. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. He also is going to reference John 3.36, mm -hmm. which says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What's very interesting is the word believe appears in the English twice. He who believes will have everlasting life. He who does not believe shall not see life. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting is it's the same word in English, but it is two different words in Greek. Mm -hmm. The first word carries with it the idea of belief or mm -hmm. faith. The second word carries with it the idea of obedience. As a matter of fact, Several English translations translate it this way. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, 
and he who does not obey the Son mm -hmm. shall not see life. Mm -hmm. That verse does not teach faith only. That's right. Um, John chapter 3 does not teach faith only. If you keep it in its context, you see that Jesus said, you've got to obey him. This is what you've got to do. If you pull one verse out of the center that says that you have to believe and that that teaches faith only, you have ignored the overriding context of John chapter 3. Yeah, you're spot on. I mean, the summary is, you must be born again, born of water and the Spirit, keeps talking to him, and then he says, hey, God loved his son, God so loved the world, whoever believes in him. Mm -hmm. What well, believes in him and what? The things that he said. That's right. I kind of rushed through my point earlier in, in the end of episode one. I looked up every passage he mentioned, John 336, 315, 524, 318, 640, and 47. They're all in the present tense in Greek. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's not saying it's just one act of belief. It's saying it's this continual process. Just like the, the, the next passage, you know, he's, he's going to go to Acts chapter 16 in mm -hmm. this segment, right? Mm -hmm. And belief is a process at times, right? Mm -hmm. So in Acts 16, he, he reads Acts 16, 30, and 31. And then he stops. Right. Is, is that where the story stops, or does the story continue? Uh, the story continues, and that's what's so important. In Acts 16, 31, Paul and Silas tell the jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved and your household. But let's keep reading. In verse 31, he tells them that if they will believe, they will be saved. Now, the question for this jailer is believe what? Mm -hmm. This man is a heathen. What are you going to tell this heathen man? If he was talking to a Jew, they would have some background. They would have some knowledge of something. Uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, you had some Jews who already believed. Mm -hmm. And so when they asked what they needed to do, he told them to repent and be baptized. Mm -hmm. Here's a heathen jailer. He says, what do I need to do? And they said, believe. Why would they tell him that? That's the first step in the process. That's where all of this is going to begin for him. And it's understood that he has to believe and follow through, mm -hmm. not believe only. Mm -hmm. And so he says, what do I need to do? They tell him in verse 31, he needs to believe. The question would be, believe what? Mm -hmm. The next verse says, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, verse 33, and they took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. And so they told him to believe. They told him what to believe. Mm -hmm. Immediately they were baptized. Now watch the next verse, because this is very important. Verse mm -hmm. 34 says, Now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them. Now listen. And he rejoiced, comma, having believed in God with all of his household. Mm -hmm. After baptism, mm -hmm. the Bible says, having believed in God. This is why this is important. Having believed is a perfect tense participle denoting the completion of a process. Mm -hmm. His faith wasn't real faith until it was obedient faith. Mm -hmm. And so he, being a heathen, was told you have to believe. He was told what to believe. That included baptism. Immediately he was baptized. And then, having believed, after he was baptized, mm -hmm. the Bible says, having believed. And so this is not a faith-only passage. Again, you can pull it out of context mm -hmm. and say, look at this one verse. But when you look at the overriding context, you see it was not faith-only. You know, you're right. Every time I hear this story brought up, I've seen it on billboards where they'll have Acts 16, 30, and 31. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household, and you'll be saved. And no one ever, I mean, multiple times now I've heard different guys make this argument, and they always stop at verse 31, as right. if that's where the Bible start, right. stops. But, you know, Romans, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, right. hearing by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. In verse 32, the guy, I don't even think the guy had faith yet. They mm -hmm. said, believe. And then what did they do in verse 32? They taught him. That's right. Hearing the Word of God generated his faith, and then his faith led him to repent, wash their stripes, showing repentance, and be baptized, just like you said. And that's why you've got to even look at the context, not only after that verse, but before the verse. That's right. Who is this man? That's right. Why was he told this? Why would you start there with him? This is a heathen. He has no background. When you understand that context, you understand why they would start with that comment. You're absolutely him. right. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned Acts 2, and we've talked about Acts 22. It's kind of like when you give somebody directions. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of idea of what must mm -hmm. I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. You see that, I mean, many times in the book of Acts, but you know, in Acts chapter uh, 16, you have a guy who says, what do I do? They say, believe. Right. Okay, what do I believe? 
So he's told about repentance, belief, confession, baptism. Mm -hmm. But then you look at Acts chapter 2, those people already believed. Yeah. And what were they told? They weren't told as this guy would have you believe in Acts 16. If you believe, that's it. Right. No, you believe, great. You need to repent and be baptized to have your sins forgiven. That's and right. then in Acts 22, you have a third step, the guy who's the furthest on his journey, yeah. the Apostle Paul already believes yeah. in fasting and praying, Acts 9-9 yeah. nine, nine, for three repented. days, 9-11, mm -hmm. already been penitent, yeah. praying for forgiveness if yeah. we use our brains. Yeah. And yet when Ananias gets to him, he says, you got one step left. That's right. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. That's right, which explains why different answers are sometimes given. That's right. The Bible teaches you have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And so if a man's done the first two, and he asks what he needs to do, he's going to be told the remaining three. That's right. And so it depends on which step he's at, which answer he's going to get. That's exactly right. In this next clip, he's going to do some discussion in Romans 4. It's a shorter clip. Romans 4 is a context that we're going to have to stop and, and go into a little bit. So let's look at this next one. Romans chapter 4, verse 5, However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Paul is saying, you don't have to do any work. There's nothing you need to do beyond placing your faith in Jesus Christ that is going to get you into heaven. So Don, he says, he, he reads Romans chapter 4, and verse 5. He said, there's nothing you need to do beyond placing your faith in Christ that will get you to heaven. In context, we keep talking about this being very important. Right. Is that what Romans 4 is discussing? No, that is not the point of Romans 4. Romans 4 is not for the purpose of teaching faith only. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's commonly used in the denominational world because they'll pick out uh, one or two verses here to try to teach that. The context of Romans chapter 4 is to correct a problem that existed in the first century, and that is the Jews kept going back and they were trying to bind aspects of the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. And so Paul is writing this book trying to tell them, you can't bind these works of the law of Moses. They did not save the Jews. That law was not good enough. Don't try to bind it on Christians. Don't try to strap it on to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And particularly one of the works that they were always trying to bind was circumcision. That's right. And so in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, he's addressing those Jews who said that circumcision was still necessary, mm -hmm. circumcision being a work of the law. Mm -hmm. He's saying it's no longer needed. And he even shows how Abraham was justified without circumcision. That's right. Now, of course, he was before the law, but he was justified by his faith without circumcision. One thing I think is very important to notice, though, is even Abraham was not justified by faith alone. Mm -hmm. And they want to cite that, well, Abraham was justified by faith, but it wasn't faith alone. Mm -hmm. If you read James chapter 2 and verse 21, he says, was not Abraham our father justified by works mm -hmm. when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works mm -hmm. and by works faith was made perfect? Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, James 2.26 says, faith without works of obedience is dead. You can't be saved with a dead faith. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to keep it in the context of Romans chapter 4. It's works of the old law that will not save you, but it is the system of faith in Jesus Christ that will save us. Yeah, I think a lot of times the book of Romans, the overall thrust of the book just gets completely ignored. Right. You know, the idea of Romans is dealing with a first century problem. Okay? Mm -hmm. it's, it's an all century problem, but mm -hmm. specifically a first century problem, trying mm -hmm. to bind the law of Moses. Right. You look at Romans 1, he talks about how the Gentiles were sinners, mm -hmm. 17 through 32. Mm -hmm. Romans 2, he says, but you Jews have the law, you're just as guilty. Mm -hmm. Romans 3, all have sinned, mm -hmm. all are sinners. And then in Romans 4, he starts to show these Jews do you know how circumcision, do you know why I know, Paul says, that circumcision is not needed to be justified? Look at Abraham. Yeah. He was justified, Genesis 15, 6, mm -hmm. before circumcision was ever given, right. Genesis 17. Now, I always like to point out that Genesis 15, 6 wasn't the beginning of Abraham's relationship. That's Genesis 12 is where right. it was. And when he was called, he obeyed and went out, Genesis 12, 1 through 4. But yeah, so a lot of times the context of Romans gets misused and so, you know, I, we've talked about this. I always tell people, look at Romans 4, 1 and 2, and look at James 2, 21. One of them, James 2, 21, says Abraham was justified by works. Romans 4 says he wasn't justified by works. Well, what's the only solution? 
the Bible can't contradict itself. That's right. That's evidence that it's two different types, types of works. Of works. Yeah. And so the works Romans is discussing are works of the law of Moses. And you know, if you just search the word, you know, Romans 3.27, where is boasting? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Of the law of Moses? No, but by the law of faith, the gospel. So Romans is contrasting just like Galatians. Yeah. You don't need to keep the works of the law of Moses. You need to obey the gospel. Yeah. I think it's funny too that he even made um, a comment about, he said, there's nothing you need to do beyond placing your faith in Christ that will get you to heaven. Yet Romans six seventeen says that when they obeyed from the heart, they right. obeyed that form of doctrine being then set free from sin. Yeah. So Paul says, when were they set free from sin? He's mm -hmm. telling the Romans, I'm calling you back to when you were obedient from the heart. Mm -hmm. And the context of Romans 6 is when they put on Christ in baptism. That's right. So, Yeah, the way I typically hear people use the book of Romans is they want to say, this is a book to, that is, is used to show that we are saved by faith only, mm -hmm. not by works that you have done. That's the way Romans is used. And that's not what Romans is about. Romans is a book to show we are not saved by works of the old law, mm -hmm. but by the system of faith in Jesus Christ. That's right. And if you go back and understand the book, um, the works are not the works they're talking about. The faith is not the faith that they're talking about. That's right. They have um, pulled a few verses out of context and twisted it. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, we keep saying this, but if you pull any verse out of context, it becomes a pretext, That's is right. the old saying. That's right. So. Yeah, I would say if somebody wants to test this, just read through Romans yourself, a little highlighter, circle. Highlight every time you see Jew, Gentile, every time you see faith, gospel, versus works of the law of Moses. Yeah. Some of the newer translations change the ergon, the Greek word for works, and they write deeds, which mm -hmm. is confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... Um, you know, just look at that. You'll see repeated over throughout the whole book this mm -hmm. contrast between Jews, Gentiles, circumcision, works. Yeah. So that's that's what I would recommend for somebody to, to look into. So, all right. In this next section, it's about twenty seconds. He's going to bring up a, a favorite verse as well, and so we'll we'll analyze that. Ephesians two eight and nine. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not faith plus works, not faith plus baptism. And this is not from yourselves, meaning there's nothing you can do. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, Don, in this one, he, he goes to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which mm -hmm. is a, a great verse. It's scripture. Mm -hmm. We love it. Yeah. But sometimes it's one that, that gets, like we said, pulled out of its context. Um, what would you say when he says, it says not faith plus works, not faith plus baptism. It just says faith. Um, if you go back and look at the background of this particular passage, of course, the background of the book of Ephesians is Acts chapter 19, mm -hmm. where the church in Ephesus was founded on Paul's third missionary journey. Mm -hmm. Paul is now writing to the Ephesians years later in the epistle we call the book of Ephesians. Mm -hmm. And he reminds them, for by grace you have been saved. He's not telling them how to be saved here. That's right. They were already saved. He's reminding them that they were saved by grace through faith. Now, the question is, how were they saved through grace? Mm -hmm. That's the question. That's they right. were saved by grace through faith. How were they saved through faith? Listen to this passage from Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith. What did we just notice in Ephesians 2? Mm -hmm. They're saved by grace through faith. For you are all sons of God through faith. We become children of God. We are saved through faith. Listen again. We are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for, mm -hmm. this is the Greek word gar, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Mm -hmm. The word for here, this begins to introduce the reason. Mm -hmm. That is, they were children of God by faith in that they had been baptized. And so this is not faith only, mm -hmm. but this is faith that was obedient and responded in baptism, mm -hmm. which is what saved them and added them to the family of God. So we are saved by grace through faith, and that is the faith that obeys God 
and we are baptized into Christ. You know, I think sometimes, like you said, people forget the, the background. You know, a lot of times people have studied this passage in Ephesians and never read Acts 19, 1 through 6, yeah. where he says, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they yeah. say, we haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. And he said, what were you baptized? Right. With well, John's baptism. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 that's not good enough anymore. Right. So he baptizes them in the name of Jesus Christ. That's right. And then he lays hands on them. Yeah. They receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So when people don't know that background story, yeah. they come to Act, or Ephesians and they get confused by some of these verses. Yeah. And so... You know, I always like to look, and you look in Ephesians chapter 2, you know, we know Paul is the, the author, right? Inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But look at what Paul says. Look, look at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which with he loved us. Mm -hmm. So he, Paul says, me and the Ephesians together, loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved and raised us up together. He says, the way you were saved from your sins is the same way I was saved. Mm -hmm. When did God raise Paul up and forgive his sins? Acts 22, 16. Yeah. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So Paul would not teach somebody else to become a Christian in a different way than That's he right. became a Christian. Sure. Yeah. And so you look through that whole text and raised us up together. Romans 6, 3 and 4. When's a person raised to walk in newness of life? Baptism. When they come up out of the waters of baptism. Yeah. So it, it's very easy to, to grab a verse uh, out of context and say, well, it says by grace through faith, not of works. Well, then you have the discussion of, well, what works is he talking about? Which, you know, we could go into. And if you want more details, you can always reach out to us. But either way, you can't have passages that contradict each other. Now, That's there's right. another statement that, that he mentioned. And, and if, if you want to add something more to that, you can go back. But he made the statement, uh, Mr. Parr, he said, this not of yourselves from mm -hmm. that verse. And he then said, what that means is it's nothing you can do. It's right. a gift. Now, let's look at the verse. I'll let you, you know, uh, exposit it. But this not of yourselves, that doesn't mean there's nothing you can do. What, what is the, the focus of this is not of yourselves in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? Uh, of, of course, um, the verse says, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. And then he goes on to say, this is not of yourself. First, let me say this. We agree there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. Absolutely. Is that what this verse is saying? Uh, that is the question. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of debate about exactly how to translate this verse. Mm -hmm. uh, some Greek text, such as the Textus Receptus, mm -hmm. when you read Ephesians 2a, it has the definite article, the for by grace are you saved through the faith. Mm -hmm. That would indicate mm -hmm. we are saved by grace through the gospel system of faith. Mm -hmm. Then when you see the phrase, and that not of yourselves, you have to ask, what is it that's not of ourselves? The salvation is not of ourselves. The system of faith is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Mm -hmm. It is not of works. When you read about the works frequently, in fact, most of the time in the New Testament, he's talking about the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. And so if that's a proper interpretation of this passage, mm -hmm. what you would have is this. For by grace are you saved. That is the gospel system. God sent his son. That is the grace. That's God's expression of grace. For by grace you have been saved. Mm -hmm. And that uh, through faith... Through the faith, let me back up, for by grace you've been saved by what God did through the faith. He gave you this system of faith. It's not of yourselves. You didn't do this. Mm -hmm. This is something that God has done for you mm -hmm. and has provided for you. So we have salvation that comes from God. The system comes from God. The grace comes from God. So he's not telling us in this passage that we can't earn salvation per se, mm -hmm. but rather he's telling us that we got this system of salvation from God. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think there's some pretty good, um, some pretty good evidence too. I mean, like you said in Ephesians 2, 8, the definite article, uh, it's a majority of Greek manuscripts, majority text, um, some of the Alexandrinus fifth century codexes. And there's also internal evidence. Um, I think there's other two other times where the article's included, where you have this phrase. So no matter how you take it, it still has to line up with other verses. And I mm -hmm. think you're saying it's perfect is what's that not of yourselves? That's not saying it's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. It's saying this is God's idea. You didn't right. earn it. You didn't merit it. God gave it to you. Right. So I agree. And of course, agree. as I stated at the beginning, we're not saying that you can earn it. That's it right. It is certainly true 
that there is nothing you can do. We will never be good enough. Mm -hmm. If we go to heaven eternally, it's going to be because the grace of God sent Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to die for us. He provided this system, which we still have to accept. We have to comply with. We have to obey in order to be saved. I will never be so good that God is obligated to let me into heaven. And I'm thankful for that because yes. none of us will be good enough. That's right. I always think it's interesting when someone says, you know, speaks about a gift. Mm -hmm. I just think of the many times in Scripture, you know, all people will agree if someone gives you a gift, you have to, to do, you receive it according to the giver's terms. Uh, we mention this about every time we talk about this, but Joshua 6, God says, I've given you a city, Jericho. Mm -hmm. What do you have to do to receive it? March right. around it. Right. Could, could Joshua puff his chest up with his soldiers and say, look what we did? That yeah. was a gift. I think about uh, in John 9, 11, the pool of Siloam, right, where the man's healed. And what did Jesus do? 9, 11 of John. He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Would that man say, look at the, the, the sight that I just earned, the right. healing of my vision? No, of course not. He'd say, this man, Jesus, gave me what a gift of my sight. Right. But yet God said, hey, Jesus said, hey, go and wash. That's right. Second Kings 5, Naaman, cleanse of his leprosy. What did he say? Go dip in the Jordan. Yeah. There are things that God says, whenever you do this, it's a gift, it's a promise, the forgiveness of your sins. But I'm going to uh, give you the, the thing I promised you, the gift, when you do what I've asked you to do. That's right. Yeah. I frequently hear people uh, focus on Ephesians uh, 2, 8, and 9, where it says it is a gift of God. And they say a gift is free. You don't have to do anything, but you still have to receive it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how do you receive the gift? Exactly right. And that's what we're debating, really. That's exactly right. So we had about a minute 30. Um, this next section is going to be Galatians 2, so it's it's probably going to get a little bit deep. What would you say as far as with Ephesians and the background that it has, what would you say, is it interesting, or maybe let me phrase it this way, where in the epistles from Romans to Revelation do you ever see the idea that, hey, now you're a Christian, be baptized? Uh, of course, what we have to keep in mind is the book of Acts is the book of conversions, mm -hmm. and we learn about people being told what to do to be Christians. And so we see people being told to be baptized over and over and over. Once you get to the book of Romans, you have these epistles that are written, being written back to people who are already Christians. Mm -hmm. These people have already been baptized. And so he references um, what they did to become Christians and things of that nature. But he's not telling these people to be baptized mm -hmm. because these are already baptized believers. You know, it's interesting if I start thinking through some of the books. In Romans chapter 6, he calls this entire church back to their baptism. That's right. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, calling them back to their baptism. That's right. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians 3, mm -hmm. 26 and 27. Mm -hmm. Ephesians, Paul says, you were raised up like right. I was. Philippians, Colossians 2. Yeah. Over and over, you go through these letters and you see him calling them back to Revelation 1, 5, 9, maybe, when they were washed by the blood. Right. So you see he's always calling them back to the baptism and shows that's that's when they became Christians. Yeah. So, Thanks for joining us on uh, part two, and we'll see you back on part three of Answering the Air. Thank you so much for watching Answering the Error today. If you have any questions about the topic, even if you disagree, or maybe you say, you know, I just want more information, please contact us. We love your soul. We'd love to give you some more information to read, and we'd love to try to help you ascertain the truth of God's Word. Thanks for watching.